To begin, thank you everyone for being here. We're excited to have you here with us this evening uh, for our third installment of our Arts and Sciences in Concordia International Center Global Perspectives Lecture Series. Tonight, we turn our focus to Asia and the Middle East, and I'm very pleased to moderate this event. And so uh, how it runs is we have 10 minute presentations from a very interesting group of students and staff here at Concordia. We're here to uh, share with you tonight. They're very excited to uh, to present to you, and and at the end of our time. The panelists questions that you things you may want to know if you're uh, Oh, it says my connection is unstable. Can you never can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sure. That's great. I wanted to wait until the connection came back because I didn't want to be talking. And okay, uh, so again, uh, we will have a, a Q and A session towards the end of the uh, after the four talks uh, have concluded. And if you're uncomfortable with making a, a question um, with, uh, with uh, on the Zoom, you can always send me the question individually in the chat to me. I'd be happy to post the question to the panelists and, and I, I really welcome any questions that you have, things that you want to learn more about. And also if you're here to, and if you're receiving credit for from a class for being here tonight, if you want to separately in the chat, uh, send a direct message to me that lets me know your uh, course professor and your, along with your name which will show when you when you send that to me, you don't need to give me your name. I can send that on to your professor as well to let them know that you are here. So thank you again for being here. Before we get to the presenters, I'm going to ask Ms. Marquardt from the International Center to share a little bit of information on study abroad opportunities in this part of the world that we're learning about tonight. Ms. Marquardt, if you'd like to share with us a, a little bit of some of the programs that are available and how students might connect with study abroad here at Concordia if they have an interest in, in seeking out a program in this part of the world. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian and Professor Gunderson. And thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. It is so lovely to have you. Um, our, our panelists are uh, have been preparing and have some wonderful presentations, I know. Um, but to keep in mind that we are learning about these wonderful places here while we're in the United States, but these people come from all over the world and you can travel to their country as well. Um, if perhaps not every single country represented tonight, but quite a few in, in, in their continents. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat here information on how to reach our international um, study abroad office. Um, Maggie Limekuller is not able to attend this evening. But um, I've put her information here where she is more than willing to have individual meetings with you if you are wanting to study abroad. And also I put in their, their Instagram and their Facebook. So they're always posting out new events that are happening. In fact, I know there's one coming up where they're talking about Winterum, um, I believe. So check those out. They're, they're really wonderful and Maggie is very helpful and caring for each of her students. Um, so thank you. And I'm excited to hear from everybody tonight. Thank you, Ms. Marquardt. Hey, same here. Very, very excited for these presentations. So let's begin. Uh, we, our first presenter is Rael Faraj, who is a student studying here at Concordia in the Rehabilitative Sciences program. Uh, so Ray, you have access to share your screen and we, we see it up there on, on, the, on the screen already. So we're seeing it good. So uh, the floor is yours and, and we're excited for your presentation. Hi, I'm Ragad Al Faraj, and I'm going to talk about Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia was found in 1720 and became an independent country on September 2, uh, 23, 1932 by Abdul Aziz Al Saud, the father of today's leader, King Salman Al Saud. Riyadh is the capital city of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a monarchy country. So we don't have presidents, we don't vote. It's the royal family that um, leads the country. 
uh, most uh, traditions and uh, cultures are based off of Islam religion and Islamic culture. Saudi Arabia is a custodian of the two holy mosques. One of them is Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca. Uh, and this is also where Kaaba is. Kaaba is the center of the earth and it's where Muslims uh, pray to. So whenever you see a Muslim that's praying, they're praying to that specific place. They actually have a, a compass on the phone or with them in their hands and it directs them directly to the Kaaba. And Kaaba is made out of pure gold. Even the black thing that you're seeing in the picture right here. I don't know if you see the me pointing, but um, even the black thing that's covering it, the gold part is pure gold. And what's interesting about it is um, we have a specific time in the year where we have Al-Hajj and that's where people or Islam, uh, Muslims from all over the country come and visit Al-Kaaba and, and it's actually part of Islam to visit that place. Another mosque is Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi which is Prophet Muhammad's mosque and it's in Al-Madinah. So in every Saudi paper form, everywhere, you'll find a logo, which is the palm tree and the two swords. The palm tree stands for growth and the two swords stands for justice and strength. And um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but whenever someone passes away and they put the flags down, the only flag that doesn't go down is the Saudi Arabian flag. It's because it has this saying, that Islamic saying, and it's against our religion to take that flag down. And that saying is, there is no God but Allah, and there is, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So in Saudi Arabia, there are religious holidays that we celebrate and non-religious holiday, holidays that we also celebrate. A religious holiday that we celebrate is Eid al-Fitr, which is um, right after the month of Ramadan. And what we do is we gather as families for three days, some families for a week, and we have feasts, food, desserts. We wear new clothes on all three days. We visit family. And the, the other Eid is Eid uh, Al-Adha, which is the Eid right after Hajj, which is I just told you guys about. So that goes, I would say the same, three to a week. And what we do is we do the same thing and we wait for people that come from Hajj so we, we, so we can throw them a party or celebrate it with them. A non-religious holiday is the Saudi National Day, and it's becoming really, really popular these days. And you can see right here, one of the Saudi National Day celebration. Another a non-religious holiday that we celebrate is Janadriya, and that goes for two weeks. It's a festival where you'll see local artists, um that have that do arabic calligraphy or other types of grafts and you'll see camels horse riding food dessert and it's just a fun place to be around or and so taboos things that you should not do like 100 percent don't do enough if you ever visit Saudi Arabia do not wear clothes that are too tight. So I'm not talking about this inside the house, but outside the house as a Muslim and as a Muslim community, you have to be modest. Do not wear shoes inside the house. So um, 
this is a hard thing that I actually faced in the U.S. whenever I invite someone into my house. I'm so shy to tell them that you have to take off your shoes. But it's a religious thing to us is that you have to take off your shoes because they're considered dirty because you just tipped in the street with the same shoes. And our houses have to be clean 100% all the time since we pray in them. Um, do not show the soles of your feet or shoe because it's considered disrespectful as well as do not point at people. Do not show your affection to the opposite sex. It's not just considered disrespectful, but it's against the religion. Do not say anything critical about Islam or a person's family because that will cause you a whole other issue that you don't want to deal with. <laughs> Do not hand anything to anyone with your left hand because it's considered dirty or it brings the other person bad luck. Traditional wear. So men wear a traditional dress, which we call thobe, And it depends on the season, whether it's white or black or brown. So in summer, we wear, or men wear, white light soap and in winter they wear black or brown thick soap and you can see in the picture right here what's under the black thing it's a white soap and in this i don't know if you can see it but what's under that brown thing is a black soap this picture was taken in the summer and this picture was taken in the winter and another thing is in the winter people would, if it's too cold, people will call, uh, wear a farwa. A farwa is this brown thing, and it's a dress that has fur in it. And th this fur is really thick and really heavy that will actually like heat your body up. On special occasions, or in case of a royal family, we wear bisht, which is that black thing over here and it's not only black it's white it's off-white black and brown men usually wear over their head a ghitra which is this white thing over his head or a shma which is the red one and on that on top of that they would wear a agal a agal is the circular thing over here Women would wear abaya, which is a traditional dress. And same that goes for the man goes for the woman. In summer, they would wear a light abaya. It doesn't matter what color it is, it's just light. It's just the difference of the fabric. And in winter, they would wear a thick abaya. And we have abaya for every occasion that you can ever think of. Work, weddings, parties, going out, staying in. We have one for every occasion. We also wear sharwas. Um, another thing that we wear is um, a tarha, which is a hijab. And most of the times you'll see Saudi women wearing a weird or beautiful like details on their abaya. So. A thing that's been going on for a couple of years is women would represent who they are with the abaya that they're wearing, with the details that's in it. Food. So typically we would eat wheat, rice and lamb, chicken, yogurt, potato, dates. Big thing is we're big meat and uh, rice lovers. We love our meat and rice. Um, and dates too. A traditional dish is kapsa or mfattah. Mfattah is this. And this is what we... We, don't, we won't have this on a, like an everyday. It's not an everyday thing. But it is occasional. So when we have guests, when it's Eid or weddings. A kipsa is a day-to-day -day 
face. Right? Arabs love their fat. They would pour oil, butter, any oily thing that you'll ever think of in their food. Whenever you see something that's really greasy, it's Arab food. Um, and talking about greasy, so this is a gelgel and it's actually for breakfast. They would have this for breakfast on eight. A gehwa, which is Arabic coffee, is a really, really big thing. Like, I would say we would have this religiously. So, gahwa is um, a thing that we would drink in the morning, before breakfast with dates, after lunch with dates, before lunch with dates, uh, before dinner with dates, after dinner with dates or desserts. So we'll have it before each and every meal and after one and, and uh, after each meal. And doesn't matter if we're hungry or not, doesn't matter if we're full, we'll have it. Pork and alcohol is for pitten, so it's a religious thing. Uh, we cannot eat pork or, or alcohol or something that contains any alcohol. Education. Preschool or elementary school is a two-year, two-year. Preschool is two, is two years. Elementary school is six years. So from first grade to sixth grade. Intermediate is from seventh to ninth. And secondary is from uh, 10 to 12. Um, something that I found here that's different is elementary schools from first to fifth and intermediates from six to eight, I want to say, and high school or secondary is from nine to 12. So this is another difference that I found. Uh, education is free for everyone and public school and public colleges only. Uh, so this is another thing that um, I'm not sure if it's in the United States, it's worldwide that, I mean, it's nationwide that um, you have to have financial aid to go to school, but we don't have financial aid, whether it's a public or a private school. Um, Another thing that I found different is it's really hard to get into school in Saudi Arabia because you have to have high, high marks, not in high school, but we have two tests after high school. Uh, they're like ACT and SAT, but they're called Qudarat and Tahsili. And what, what, what we'll do or what would what will the government do is they would take 40% from Qudarat and 40% from Tahsili and 20% from high school, add it up and come up with a new GPA for you. And that GPA is the GPA that you're applying to schools with. So if you don't do good on these tests, but you have a hundred, like a 4.0 in school, that doesn't matter. And another thing is so you would go, you would apply to school for, let's say, medicine, and you would get in. But after the first year, if you don't get the score that they want, which is like, I think, uh, for medicine, it's ninety-eight percent. So if you don't get that score, they'll transfer you to a different school of their choice, and you don't have a choice to change schools. You have to stay in that school. Um, so for scholarships, we do have scholarships. We have four different scholarships. We have three of them that are international, two of them that are new. So Ministry of Higher Education is our old sc typical scholarship, which is a uh, scholarship through SACM. And we have two new ones, which is a culture 
Scholarship Program and NUM International Scholarship Program. So NUM is um, Prince Mohammed's vision for two, uh, 23, creating this town. Um, and the scholarship is giving to people that they want to fulfill what they need for them to create this town. Uh, the cultural scholarship is also part of 2030 because they wanna bring more tourism into the country. Uh, the last scholarship is um, a scholarship that that's provided for private schools within the country. So if you have a high GPA, you can apply for a scholarship that will cover half of your tuition in any private school of your choice. Healthcare. So healthcare is free for citizens. Um, giving free health, uh, but in this pandemic, healthcare has been given to everyone, whether they're citizens or not. Most hospitals are owned by the government and are open for the public, so we don't have any insurance companies. The only way we can get an insurance through an insurance company if we get provided one from our job, but we don't need an insurance and we don't have to worry about it. And these are all the hospitals that we have, and they're all government hospitals. Um, the ones that you see right here are right there, are special hospital, they're forces hospitals. So you have to be either in the army or, or a special force agent to again. And here are some pictures of Saudi Arabia. This is Al Ula, which is a new city that opened in 2018 to 2019, I believe. And this is Riyadh, the capital. And these are the other small cities of Saudi Arabia. Uh, can you guys see it okay? Yeah, we can and see it good. Okay? Yep, yeah. yeah, you're good. Okay, I can start it then. So, uh, I am representing uh, South Korea. So, this is like a general um, content of it. So, like, if you see, like, the background, it's the traditional house called Hano. Um, it's made with wood without any, any nails in it. So Republic of Korea. The size is pretty small. It's about like 1.2 times smaller than New York itself. Um, and the population is uh, 50 million. Um, and we have four different seasons, the same as here at in Wisconsin, but way much um, hot like hotter, warmer than here in Wisconsin. Uh, the Seoul is the capital of South Korea and the language is Korean. So this is like a small um, short history part of South Korea. Um, so we had um, like a Japanese colonial period in 1910 to 1945, which is pretty recent. So, and we get um, independent by um, August 15, 1945. And there was a Korean War between South and North. And finally, Korea was um, established in 1948. So it's like uh, the South Korea itself is pretty young country. Um, there are like a couple images of South Korea when um, they were colonized by Japan and these two photos are um, during the Korean War and if you see this 
um, map. It's like a current map that is divided into half. So this whole um, peninsula was one before then. Um, so Republic of Korea. Uh, Korea is a pres presidential representative de democratic republic country. So we have a um, president and everyone over 18 vote themselves directly. So currently we have Jane Moon for our 19th president. Um, so this photo is our president and the uh, the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong Un, Jong Un Kim, yeah. So um, so Korea use Korean for language, and we have our own um, alphabet to write the language. Um, so it is called Hangul. So um, it kind of combines the features of alphabetic and syllab syllabic writing system. Um, it's called alphabetic syllabary. So you basically could write most of um, sounds into Korean, like even like different languages besides Korean too. So um, the fun fact about Korean, the alphabet is, um, I heard that it's the only alphabet, like the language um, that has none of like who made it. You know, like, so <laughs> the fourth king of Joseon dynasty um, called Sejong the Great created and promulgated a new alphabet called Hangul in 1443. Um, this is uh, like an image of him. Um, so this is our traditional clothing called Hanbok. So this is like a little couple of images of like um, hanbok and this this two like photos are like an actual photo um so you could have like noticed in fact that they're wearing like white clothes a lot so that's why korea has a nickname called the people of white clothes so they they used to like they used to wear white a lot um because white kind of represents like a humble Thing and white itself means bright future and hope. And so they, um, they historically like to wear white clothes. It's like not easy to keep it clean all the time, but they did. Uh, and you, um, here are some like hats that they're we wearing. So the hat itself represents like a class and jobs that they have. So if, um, there is anyone who like watched some Korean like historical drama or movie, you could have noticed them wearing like a ha interesting hats a lot. So, um... Oh, <laughs> yeah, in Netflix, yeah. So um, I've got some traditional food of Korea. Um, this is bibimbap. It's basically rice with a lot of different uh, vegetables or meats with sauce. This is kimchi. It's fermented cabbage. Um, it's really healthy for your guts. And here is bulgogi. It is made with um, like soy sauce. And this is tamgyeopsal. It's uh, pork. It is really tasty. <laughs> it's um, the same part of um, bacon, but it's like thicker. So good. Uh, <laughs> here is a like um, a shot of traditional Korean meal. So we need rice, soup, and um, several different side dishes all together. This looks way pretty. We don't normally take that much side dishes all the time. It's just a pretty image of it. And for the culture part, um, I guess that um, maybe if um, you're interested in Korean culture, you've probably heard of like 
K-pop genre and like a movie. Um, and also, esports is really famous、um, in Korea. We have a PC bank called like a place only for like PC stuff, like um, like um, to do game. And they have everything there.、Um, and this is a B boy.、Uh, B boy is also really famous in Korea. So、um, this is a、um, religion in Korea. So Korea is yes, it's an Eastern Asia, East Asia. But、um, we actually have a lot of Christians in our、um, country. So about like more than half、uh, populations have are atheists.、Um, besides them, <clears throat> like twenty.、Um, More than half percent are Christian, so twenty totals are Protestants, and eight、uh, percent are Catholic, and only like fifteen point five percent are Buddhist.、Uh, but culturally, we have a lot of like Buddhism, like culture part. So、um, it doesn't mean that、uh, we don't take any like our traditional like Buddhism part. We also have it as like a culture, but it doesn't mean that we believe in like the Buddhism a lot.、Uh, yeah.、Um, for for just myself, I went to public elementary school and、um, I went Christian middle and high school. I'm just saying that we have a lot of Christian in Korea too. Um, so I just want to show you、uh, a video. So before talk,、um, watching the video, I'm gonna tell you about one thing. It's called pansori. Pansori. It's a Korean genre of musical storytelling performance by a singer, one singer called Sorikun, and one drummer called Gosu. It performed between three to six hours by one single singer. And one single drummer.、Uh, so the video. So this is like an image of them performing pansori. So、um, the video that I'm、uh, planning to show you all is a、um, a video about Seoul. Like they took a lot of different places in Seoul with、um, pansori. The music, like the background of music, is pansori. It's be performing. We um we understand it by like a current artist, and they do dance with the song. Song um that we are listening is called Sugunga. It's a traditional fairy tale. Um, and I'm gonna show you this video. Can You all see this video, okay? Yeah, we can see it. Can you do you do you hear? Can you hear the voice, like the the sound too? No. No, I don't hear the sound. Ah,、uh, I'm gonna share the game, including the videos. Then、um, I mean, like just sounds. I hope you can hear it this time. Yep.、Oh, okay. Yeah, we can hear that. Yeah. So it's Seoul. If you guys watch、um, the Parasite, you could probably realize the one of the place in there. Oh, oh, oh. 
If you guys are like, if you like this video, there are more cities that are performed by like exact same dancers and like same team of artists, like the singers. So maybe just Google "Feel the Rhythm of Korea." You will see a lot of different videos from there. Um, oh, we have a Korean club at Concordia. We do study Korean together. Like we have volunteers of Korean who teach Korean to like other people. Um, we also share foods in my like, culture. We watch t uh, movies together, and we have a dance crew who so, um, dance K-pop dance. So that was it. Um, I thank you. <laughs> Good. Absolutely. Okay, um, I think everybody should be able to see my screen um, of the uh, slideshows. Um, so, um, thank you everyone, and I'm appreciate that I have the chance to um, give an actually my understanding of some of the same probably the people who outside China doesn't really know. And I have to admit that uh, it is so complex. Probably you give me uh, 10 hours, I probably even cannot explain everything I know, but I will just give you some of the interesting I feel, uh, especially some of things my friends asked me about before. Uh, so first of all, I uh, everybody can call me Blade and all of my friends uh, call me Blade here. Uh, if you uh, find it hard to pronounce my name. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is something I think, uh, as I said, it's some, something in, in cultural points of China, which I think might be slightly uh, mystery or like um, you never know. One of the common questions I found it really hard to answer is uh, my friends, especially the friend made me first like to ask me, hey, uh, where do you, wh which part of China, where do you coming from? It's actually I found it's one of the very awkward questions for me to answer. Let me show you why. So first of all, let's give I will just give you some brief overviews of China. So we have uh, um, 1.4 billion people and the United States has 3 billion. So we are actually about four times of the United States people population. And you can see it by the land size, or we are almost like equal size uh, in China. United States is slightly larger. And um, we were divided into uh, 34 different provinces, uh, including Taiwan, and the United States has uh, 50 states. Um, the difference is in that China is divided this land into 34, but the United States is in 50 states, joined them together to form the United States. Uh, so that is one of the differences because our government from top, is top down, uh, United States is, is bottom up. So as you see, when China is so big, and when you ask me where do I coming from, uh, yes, I can give you the name of my province, or you can say states, but how it makes sense to you where I'm coming from. Then let me show you, this is the map of China. Uh, um, we always like to joke um, the modern uh, land of China has the shape of uh, like a chicken. You can say there's a chicken head, there's a chicken uh, feet, actually two feet, and there's a chicken tail and a chicken body. 
um, traditionally we divided in this line that is the boundary between north and, and the south, north southern of China. And because of uh, we are um, a traditionally agricultural um, society. So that's why we, um, this boundary means um, on the south, it has more rain, much more rain than the north. Then that's you know, why we divide it. And the sometimes we also divide into uh, western and the eastern. The real big difference is because eastern is close to the ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean, and the western are all in on land. Um, then let me talking about uh, the uncertain question, where I'm coming from. Here is a place I'm, I'm from. You can see it's actually in the center of the southern east. If you go back to uh, have, if you have a brief me memory of what I said about what's it, where is the southern China, where is the northern China, I belong to the south. And uh, uh, also, it's relatively closer to the uh, sea coast, uh, but of course, it still needs uh, thousands of miles away from the sea coast. Uh, but when I just given the name of the province, none of my friends could really find it out. Oh, I they don't really have the understanding. So sometimes I would say maybe you can say things like uh, North Carolina uh, in US. Uh, if you think about it, as if it's a map of uh, United States, um, then when this is our capital, uh, Beijing, uh, Beijing city, which is uh, 800 miles away from my hometown, and uh, Beijing is similar to Washington DC. It is a relatively smaller um, area which actually um, uh, stand alone because it's uh, the, a political center and also we all sometimes call it a, a cultural center too but mainly it's a political center. Um, I had my um, say before my high school I am in, in my hometown and then my uh, undergraduate was taken in Shanghai and the, Shanghai is actually, uh, that is not uh, 200, that is uh, also, that is uh, also uh, 800, eight, um, it should be 800, 800 miles away from my hometown too. Um, and um, people were also curious about uh, Wuhan, actually, that is a nearby province to my hometown, and uh, my aunt lives in there. Um, they are still very good, and which is um, eight, 180 miles away. So my uncle lives in Guangzhou, and it is uh, 370 miles away. Um, and uh, Guangzhou is in, uh, I forgot uh, to mention that before, I think everybody probably understands, Shanghai is the economical center of uh, China which uh, similar to the uh, position of New York in the United States. And Guangzhou is another uh, economic center, but mainly it is uh, um, behaving like uh, California. It has a lot of manufacturing and uh, uh, high technology companies. And also we could see uh, Hong Kong is actually very close to Guangzhou. Um, why I mentioned Hong Kong is a lot of times not to tell my friends where I'm living, I have to tell if you go north a little bit to the inland China, then there's where I'm living from. <laughs> so, uh, and Hong Kong is uh, close to the city Guangzhou and it's a hundred miles away. Um, and uh, Taiwan is actually a hundred miles away across the sea. And on the North, um, here is the Xinjiang. Actually, Xinjiang is the largest province in China. If you can see, it's very far away from I was living. So I have never had the chance to visit there. Um, the rest of the place I've visited before, except for Taiwan. Um, and uh, uh, it is 180 miles away. Uh, Xinjiang is a little like a desert. So it's quite uh, dry, and uh, but it's not very hot because it's uh, kind of to the north. Um, then here is the Tibet. Um, we know we have the mountain Everest, which is around here. Um, 
on the border between Nepal and uh, Tibet. Uh, so it's actually a thousand uh, and uh, 500 miles away from my hometown. So uh, I spend some time explaining the geography of China is because China is a vast country that hard to explain if you don't see the map where you are living, where you are from. And because it's a vast country, so the customs of people who live in different places are very, very different. For instance, um, the people living in Xinjiang, they have a lot of Muslim there and uh, they do uh, have in different customs. I would say, um, thanks to the Saudi Arabia student that actually quite a lot of customs is are similar uh, from my understanding to my friends who from there. Okay, so then let me explain something about um, kind of the, um, uh, the one sale of the famous city. Uh, one of it is uh, the, our capital, Beijing. So Beijing has uh, uh, 22 million of uh, uh, regular residents. And uh, one of the famous thing in Beijing is, is a Forbidden Palace. Uh, it has been, uh, it was built 600 years ago uh, since um, the emperor said make the capital um, there in the, we call it the Yuan Dynasty. And it has uh, um, 720,000 square kilometers. Uh, I measure, I just compared it's about 100 football pitches in size. And here is a map. Um, it's actually both stuff uh, as the place of um, the empire and its family to live, and also the place where um, they discussing the uh, the uh, the country business, uh, like uh, the 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 uh, the national affairs. And uh, then the other famous thing of Beijing is a Great Wall. Um, it's pretty. It's even though it says it is over 10,000 miles, but actually not a lot are preserved well because uh, they are not needed anymore. Um, so it was, uh, and uh, it, it mainly is trying to um, defend against the Normans uh, to the south. And uh, it, uh, I say here it is 2030, uh, 2,300 years ago, but actually, it was not that long, uh, not as long as right now during that time. It was like years and years and years because China growing bigger and bigger. So they built a longer and longer greater wars um, in order to uh, defend the, the, um, the land. Then the next city I'm talking about is Shanghai. As I mentioned, I had my undergraduate there. Uh, Shanghai has um, uh, it was the economic center ever since the early uh, 20th century. Um, it was that time a lot of uh, Europeans, uh, Americans, and they came there and built the banks and the other companies there. So one of the famous thing we called it the white time, and actually it is uh, um, say by the side of uh, uh, Huangpu River, and uh, the funny thing is, on the west band, west band of the uh, river, you can see historical buildings, which were mostly building um, like uh, around 800 or 80 year, 80 years ago, and uh, on the other side of the river, which was a farm field before, but now it's become a lot of lot of. Uh, uh, um, uh, sky towers and uh, tall buildings. So those buildings are all over, I would say, um, 400 meters uh, in tops. And it is actually a very, very um, popular um, financial center there. Then I'm talking about the, the new uh, city, uh, which is uh, in two cities in Guangdong. And uh, as I explained before, they are actually on the uh, northern eastern coast. And uh, this city is Guangzhou, and this one is, Shen is Shenzhen. Uh, Guangzhou is relatively um, has more historical um, buildings. 
Um, but both are very new, actually, in the modern city in scale. And uh, I could say it's when you visit there, you will feel you are actually like similar to visit in uh, New York or visiting um, uh, Los Angeles. Um, they have very, very big um, modern city centers. And they are famous for um, uh, high tech and um, manufacturing. Um, and I would say um, most of the thing, for instance, like if you heard of um, um, the like the Apple phone was assembled. Actually, they were assembled in Guangzhou, at least the place nearby. Then another interesting, quite interesting topic about is the Chinese food, and that's also a lot of thing. Uh, my friend want to want to teasing at is uh, they were asking me, "Hey, is um, a Pan Express uh, Chinese food?" I would say no, uh, not even similar. But the real problem is. How, it's really hard to say which food is actually indeed Chinese food because we have too many different um, styles of uh, um, food. And uh, here it's actually showing you um, almost every place with a big populations, we have their um, special food, or like I say, a, and this special food is not only one dish, it's like all can kind of picking up 20, 30, or even more different um, uh, different type of food. Um, so here I did mention that there are eight um, great uh, region cuisines. Um, I'm from, this is my hometown. I, I said it's Changsha and the, our food is famous for spicy things. Um, and also Chengdu is another place famous for spicy food. And I can tell uh, in Wisconsin, we have pretty good um, food for, for uh, which is uh, Ch Chengdu type food. And also um, in Wisconsin, we have some good, uh, here is called Fujian cuisine. They are also very good. Uh, we have a, a very good Chinese restaurant with this type of cuisine. Um, but the, the rest are not w very popular uh, in in, uh, in Wisconsin. So I can say, even though in in Wisconsin we can find some Chinese food, but not that still a lot of different Chinese food that um, uh, you cannot experience in Wisconsin. Um, so if you are even interested in, in China, you should travel all around China to enjoy lots of other different type of food uh, and our food is not limited to what uh, animal it is uh, more or less you can say that's also people joke we eat anything uh, but i would say still we don't really eat pet um like um uh, for for me i'm afraid of eating pet um it's like scaring to us too uh so on the, on the coast, we have a lot of is the fish or the seafood. On the center, we have more, tr more food, which really um, based on uh, where its agriculture is uh, famous for. So it's based on where it grows. Um, then the next thing I'm talking about, trying to explain our neighboring countries. Um, as you see, um, China is quite big and it has lots of neighbor countries uh, around uh, Asia. So we have um, uh, Russia to the north and uh, you can see India is to the south or, south or west. And uh, we are not directly connected with South Korea because uh, North Korean is actually um, separated us. And Japan is actually over the sea, but we are also very close. Then we have the other place. Uh, well, I draw a circle here is uh, this is tra traditionally, we, uh, in my understanding, we call it um, uh, Eastern Asian. So Eastern Asian countries, we all sharing similar uh, culture. Um, okay, then the, next, then the next thing I will talk about is actually our characters. Um, so our character is a type of hieroglyph in history and you can see this is fish then it involves until this is the modern fish um, what in our language this is tree and uh, you can see how it involves 
Um, this is sun, moon, car, and horse. And uh, this old, this very ancient uh, characters is originated three thousand years ago. Traditionally, it was written on the bones and turtle shells because people use it for worshiping the god and also predicting the future. Then it was putting on the bronze vessel. It's used as also as um, special equipment, special uh, things in for for um, for the empire. Later on, it became much more popular than we written like we in uh, in carved on bamboo or wood. And then this we form a strip. The last, the last thing I would like talking about is actually our traditional religion.、Uh, I think we don't really believe in any sort of、um, uh, god or gods in our religion,、um, and most of the and we have in two kind of、uh, fundamental、uh, phil- philosophy. One is Confucianism, and another one is Taoism. These are、uh, a lot of di- having a lot of differences. So, but、uh, in when we are、uh, when we are getting there,、uh, we usually combine them together. So the the、uh, the fundamental concept of Confucianism is love. This is how we write it. And、uh, one of the ex-、uh, several extended the film meaning is peace, humble, and respecting for the hierarchy. And、uh, we,、um, because we're respecting for hierarchy, so people serve for the rulers. But also, ruler must、uh, provide a good living to to people. And now, well, another one is Taoism.、Uh, Taoism is respecting for the freedom. So they are.、Uh, What the fundamental idea is, Tao. Actually, I can think I we could、uh, think it as a principle. So one of the principle is the free will, which is mentally they we believe we just need to believe in ourselves. Another one is naturalism. It's about more or less related to the living style.、Um, so Taoism is、uh, more or less、uh, emphasize on. You live serve for yourself, so you don't you don't read. It's not read. It's like a neglecting the hierarchies in the society.、Uh, one of the thing why I mentioned that is that these two fundamental thing has very good impact.、Uh, one of the reason is、uh, it it's like、uh, you can see it's uh, like uh, uh, after Christ five hundred eighty seven we already have a national testing. To selecting the official of officers, and、uh, this is based on the philosophy and、uh, also based on the、um, practicing skills. So then, this group of people form a new hierarchy in our in the society. Then those people who rule the people or fight, who fight who trying to join the、um, those groups. All believing the same thing as I mentioned in our、uh, psycho- psychology or、uh, philosophy, then it grows our, it forms our、uh, high the moral standards for those people. So this one is say we want to having a building a, a good family relations, and we want it to、um, make a good nation, and also we want it to、um, having a peaceful nation. Then the other one is say,、uh, if we are have if we are good enough, then we want to form a peaceful world, and if we are not、um, capable enough, we want you to make sure we have a good living on ourselves. So that is, I would say,、um, the moral standards is extended、um, uh, all throughout the ancient history to nowadays modern Chinese,、uh, especially the people with.、Uh, Uh, uh, with intellectual、uh, and with education, what they wanted to become. And、uh, okay, that's it.、Uh, um, everything I would like to explain.、Um, it's a little not as uh,、um, easy to honest、uh, to to follow as the previous uh, presenters, um, but I hope you would enjoy something. And also, I would like to accepting any discussions afterwards. Thank you.
job mostly where, like Kelsey, we're looking after all the stu international students. And I'm so glad to hear what we just heard from the three other students. And um, thanks for sharing, let me have sharing the screen, but actually me as a presenter, I'm a storyteller tonight. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself that we're pretty much bringing the history that just like Blake just mentioned, or even just he what he just mentioned. Myself, I was, um, my father is from mainland China. So remember, I just remind me to remember the, the image of the chicken and he's from the north. He's from the north in China and um, married my mother, who is a Japanese educated Taiwanese woman back in the fifties. So I was raised in a conservative Chinese and, um, uh, and a, a Japanese speaking mother. So of course in Chinese, Mandarin. So that is pretty much my background. And I came to the United States in my early twenties and I married my husband who is also a uh, CUW alumni back in the early 90s. We raised three wonderful children here locally in Mequon, and I live here for, for almost 30 years. And I love this place. So my focus tonight will be pretty much just to present you a, the life of a, a Chinese or Taiwanese American. I'm not going to political side that um, in Wisconsin, it's it's a wonderful and sometimes it, it's an adventurous journey. And first of all, I, uh, we, we were very lucky when my husband is at, he was at a Concordia. He, he got a wonderful got got parents who are who were the Lutherans. They all passed away, and um, they just opened their arms to take us in and feel like we are there. Chinese children. And um, that's the very first time that we feel the wonderful, the wonderful humanitarian friend from us Lutherans. And our three children even call them grandpa and grandma. Um, <clears throat> and we also, my husband and I, we also moved to Texas for a year in Dallas. So my kids, they learned to say, yes, man, yes, sir. That pretty much is the Texan thing. And we also stayed in, in Seattle for two years that my kids get to know that part of the country is liberal. The kids there, they are very different from kids in Mequon, in Wisconsin as well. So we can tell that the different, different ambience of this country. So as a, as a, as a, American of Chinese dis, uh, descent, we're very lucky that we not just domestically, we enjoy the life here. We, we also got get to have the chance to travel to see the grandparents just because my husband's job, we get to see pretty much around the globe and also China. And, but the very sorry thing is I haven't got a chance to to see my father's hometown in Northern China. And that's probably my next trip that when I go back to China, I want to visit there. Um, talking about the education that I finished my college in Taiwan. And uh, some, the we have nine years, by my generation, there's only nine years compulsory education so we have to have the uh, the entrance exam for high school for 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 colleges. So maybe you guys have a a quite stereotype for Chinese kids that they work and they contribute so much time in their in their education, especially curriculums. Well, that is not true for me. I am not just that type of kid. I like to have fun, and I like to. Um, I from since I was very young, I start to I started to realize I need to enjoy my life, and that's part of the reason I come to United States. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is that um, I have a note here, so <laughs> um, I want to talk about here 
30 years ago in Milwaukee, when I, when I was in Marquette, that there was no Oriental noodle store at all. So my dream is always, I want to open a shop for that. But later, a couple of years later, there's a noodles company show up, which is not authentic at all, the noodles, but everybody's happy. We are glad to see the diversity in the market on uh, food, especially um, he wants to mention about Korean food and the Arabic food that you guys are really lucky in this generation that you could, you see that kind of diversity in, in, in business. And um, um, when, I, when my kids were young and I tried to show the pride that I have from the Asian society that I came from. So I let them bring the dumplings and most of their classmates wouldn't understand pops, what is popsicles, what is sushi, or even I, I'm a noodle for them. I, 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 I feel like I'm a model mom, but they come back to tell me, hey, say, mom, I don't want to bring this to school tomorrow because my, my classmates, they don't understand that. Sometimes they will give them, ew, that kind of face. I said, don't worry about it one day you would understand and now they totally understand that how lucky they were so that's the that's just one of the size as a, a zero generation immigrant family like mine and uh they learn chinese but i have to say that the chinese character is very difficult for English or Latin language background because the character system is totally different. So they have to spend a lot of time to understand that. But good enough that they learn to speak Chinese, which is not that fluent, but it's great to communicate, good enough to communicate with the grandparents. And religious wise, I'm so glad that at this point, they, some of them, I have three kids, so maybe one or two of them is following um, the, the, the Christian and one is following as dad as, um, I would say that's more like Taoism or Buddhism, like um, Blade just introduces that the, the, the meaning of Chinese philosophy that um, they, they want to pursue, but I don't think they get it, but that's okay. I will, I will spend more time with them about that, but if, any students in the in the class right now that you get to listen to this and you are interesting, you are interested in knowing more about the Chinese philosophy. I have some books in my office. Is or you can just go to the library to borrow that. Um, the other thing, well, um, I have to say thank you, thank you to Concordia students, especially early childhood major, if we have any students from that. Um, while I'm raising my three younger kids, I rely on great, tremendously on the babysitter from Concordia. And they are great, wonderful students. So I get to know the value and um, the, the perspective that they could help with my kids while I went gone. <laughs> And so I had four years with two girls from the early childhood. So I have to say that you girls are wonderful. If you have, we have gentlemen here, you are also wonderful too. And um, <clears throat> well, the other thing I want to mention that um, as a, a Chinese or Taiwanese American living in Wisconsin, that we have wonderful experiences here, that this is a wonderful place to raise children, to build a family that um, compare with South in Texas, that this is just my personal, pers personal speaking, uh, compare with the South in Texas or West in, in Seattle, even in the East compare with um, uh, North Carolina that we have been to also that I think this place is really great for family, for family building. It's value, like Milwaukee is a German town that, and, and 
well, this is not metro, that metro city like Chicago, New York, or Los Angeles. But if you want to get to have a, a taste of the city, you, you just go down to Chicago, you will get it. And um, job wise, uh, very lucky that we had a, we have a, a fair life here. And also, um, for the this community that in Mequon, that um, that is wonderful for international students. We are we we are listed as top, one of the top safety campus of safety. It's safe here, and um, in terms of business, the Milwaukee is getting into from the blue collar into white collar during the past 30 years. That's what I found as myself. Sometimes I get involved in inter international business of import exports. So I get to see the transformation of, of the Midwest. So um, especially since um, Angie, you are, a business, you are from business school that I would highly recommend or the class or the students right now here that there's a, there's a, uh, there's a documentary film named American Factory on Netflix. It's top, well, I, I would type it down later on. American, American Factory on Netflix. The students we would have, especially for business students, you would have tremendous culture shock. That's a, a glass factory, they moved to, not they moved, they start, they start a, a glass factory in Dayton, Ohio. And in during the film, you will see all the conflicts, all the expectation and the, into the reality. So that uh, that's one thing that I just found recently and highly recommend for business, business students. Well, so with my background, um, and I am kind of semi-retiring <laughs> stage in Concordia. So um, my job is looking after uh, international students and international center we're working very hard to cover <sighs> the life, the culture, the academic to provide more diverse facets to international students to enrich we want to enrich their experience here. So it's a beautiful campus and also they will get an enriched experience here. Okay, that's about my my presentation. But you're welcome to leave any questions after and I will be happy to.